We're here with Nuriel Rubini, a man who needs no introduction, especially at a time like this. Nuriel, I was listening to a talk you gave recently where you, you framed this, that your best case for what we were seeing moving forward was a greater recession, meaning a recession worse than the Great Recession. And the worst case was a greater depression, meaning a depression that could be worse than even the Great Depression. How did you get to where you are right now? And what are we looking at? Well, I was looking very carefully at what was going on with the economy and the markets. And already, literally at mid-January, uh, I have a proprietary tool. It's called the boombast.com uh, uh, signal. That market was signaling that uh, the S&P 500, when it reached uh, about uh, 3,300, 3, it was vastly overbought. So every measure of price action, of valuation, and so on was suggesting that uh, we were in a bubble territory. And then the signal was sent out and was said, this is the time in which a bear market might be starting. It took only a few weeks until we got to that bear market. And since that signal, the market moved sideways, it didn't go much higher. So the market fundamentals were suggesting already that we were in a, uh, in a bubble, in an equity bubble, certainly in the United States, and that any shock could lead them to a market downturn. Now, nobody could have predicted that it would have been a pandemic, but there were plenty of other things. But when you are in a market in which the economy has too much debt and leverage, asset prices are way overbought, then any kind of macroeconomic shock or other shock can lead to not just a correction, but a significant uh, bear market. So the trigger ended up being the COVID crisis. Also early on, the market commentators were kept on saying, this is going to be just a market correction, maybe market down 5%, 10%, not a bear market. They were saying the economy is not going to go into a recession, or if there's going to be a recession, it's going to be just a quarter, and then a very rapid V-shaped recovery. Uh, I was looking at the data and seeing how the pandemic would spread from China to the rest of the world. Anybody scientifically could see it is going to go First China, then Taiwan, Korea, Hong Kong, Japan, and then it was spreading to Italy. It would get to the United States. So the WHO predicted this will be a global pandemic only later on, but anybody looking at the data could tell it was coming. And given the shock to economic activity in China, you knew that if in China you had the shutdown of economic activity, something similar, if not worse, uh, would happen in the rest of the world. So the idea there'll be a correction or a V-shaped recovery did not make any sense. That's why throughout January into early February, and then with a long piece on the Financial Times and op-ed, I said, uh, this is delusional to think this is going to be just a correction or a V-shaped recovery. This is going to be something like a bear market, first of all, and it's going to be a severe recession, not just in China, but globally, and it's not going to be a V-shaped recovery. And uh, guess what? At that time, Pretty much every market commentator kept on talking uh, their books, and their book was uh, uh, hold your position, don't go short, so don't sell, uh, it's going to be just a correction, it's going to be a mild economic slowdown. And now, guess what, a month later, literally the consensus now, we're not speaking about me, the consensus says this is going to be a recession greater than the global financial crisis. You look at what Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, Goldman Sachs are predicting. They're predicting that Q1 economic growth in the US is going to be sharply negative, between 5 to 10 percent. And in the second quarter, the economic activity, GDP, is going to fall in the second quarter at the annual rate of 25 to 30 percent. 25 to 30 percent. We have never seen anything like this. We have not seen it during the global financial crisis. We have not seen it during the Great Depression. Those were slow motion train wrecks. This is just a front-loaded, not financial shock, but a real medical economic shock. So now consensus and conventional wisdom speaks about the greater recession. So that's baked in already in the market. The fact that the market went down 35 to 40 percent has reversed itself, but only 10 percent. And in my view, there were still to come for reason I'm going to discuss. But now the consensus says this is not a correction, it's not a V-shaped recovery and it's gonna be as ugly or probably uglier than the global financial crisis. So that's baked in in the prices. The question is whether instead of a greater recession, greater than the global financial crisis, we could end up into a greater depression. 
And in my view, there are conditions under which we end up into a greater depression, not a great recession at this point is guaranteed to happen. Yeah, you, you also mentioned uh, in one of your pieces the speed at which this happened, uh, 15 days to go into a bear market, meaning a 20% decline from peak in U.S. equity prices. Absolutely. You know, if you look at the global financial crisis or the Great uh, Depression of the 1930s, mm -hmm. were slow motion train wreck. They started with a financial shock, uh, stock market crash in one case, bust of housing and mortgage in the other one, then the economy slows down. Then you go into a recession, then you have distress in debt markets, then you have a rise in unemployment rate, then it becomes acute in the case of the global financial crisis around the collapse of Lehman, and in the case of the uh, Great Depression in 32, 33, in which we, we go into a Great Depression. So yeah, you had a collapse of stock markets of 50% plus in the previous episodes. You had credit spreads going to the roof, you had a debt crisis, you had massive bankruptcies, you had... Uh, the economy tanking and GDP growth becoming vastly negative. You have unemployment going to 10, 20 percent, but it took three years. This time around, it didn't take three years. It didn't take three months. It took three weeks. In three weeks, you had a drawdown of the market of 35 percent, the fastest bear market in history. Usually it takes about uh, three, four months. This time around, it took two weeks, 15 days. And you got then the credit spreads that went from for high yield from 300 basis points of a treasury to over a thousand basis points. Last time around, when those things happened, it took about a year. This time around, it took literally less than three weeks. And same thing for economic activity. We are going to negative growth in a matter of weeks, and it's going to become much more severe. And by the second quarter, starting soon, we're going to have economic activity collapsing at the rate of 30 percent per year. And unemployment rate is skyrocketing. The number came out recently about unemployment claims. The number before was 200,000. Market were expecting 2 million. It ended up being 3.3 million, 15 times higher than the average, not even 10 times, much worse than expected. So all these things have happened in three weeks, not three months, not three years. This is like a, an asteroid literally hitting planet Earth and stopping economic activity everywhere. Usually... In previous recessions, uh, you might have a recession in Europe, but not in U.S. and China. You can have a recession in the U.S., but not in the rest of the world, or vice versa. This is a case in which we have a synchronized global recession literally happening all at the same time and going from economic growth to negative sharp growth in a matter of a month. We have not seen anything like this ever before. That's why this is worse than the Great Recession of uh, 2007, 2009, the risk is we're going to end up into a greater depression, even worse than the depression of the 1930s. Yeah, that chart for uh, new unemployment claims is unlike anything I've ever seen before. Yeah, absolutely. You know, markets were talking about initially a correction, then a V-shaped recovery, where you have one growth that is slow or negative and then fast recovery. Then people start to say, well, Maybe it's not going to be a V, maybe it's going to be a U, like the global financial crisis, uh, a downturn and then a gradual recovery to potential. Then some people start to say, well, it's going to go down and then it's going to stagnate. Uh, or people start to talk about the double dip recession, a W. It's not a V, it's not a U, it's not an L, it's not a W. Currently, it's an I. It's a straight line which you have free fall of everything, GDP, consumption of goods, of services, CAPEX, residential investment, import, exports. Pretty much every component of aggregate demand is collapsing. The only one that can actually use this balance sheet to support economic activity and a free fall, of course, is the government. We're going to talk about it. But everything is happening at the speed we've never seen before. And it's a free fall. Number like this and the speed at which are occurring did not even occur during the Great Depression. It took three years between the stock market crash of 29 and 1932, when we got into a real collapse of economic activity and a spike in unemployment rate, not three weeks. This is totally unprecedented. Yeah. You know, and for those who may not have followed your work as closely as I do, you know, the reality is over the last several years, in fact, in the uh, in the recovery from the Great Recession, you've actually, despite your nickname, been very constructive about U.S. growth and about U.S. equity. So this is really a significant turn from the position that you've held for some time now. 
Yeah, usually people refer to me as Dr. Doom. I prefer to be called Dr. Realist. And on many occasions before, like for example, in 2015 and 16, where people were worrying about hard landing of China and the global recession, I said, no, China is going to have a softer landing. It's going to be bumpy, but it's not going to trigger its own collapse and a collapse of the global economy. Or in 2015, when people said, even on Wall Street, the baseline and consensus was Grexit, that Greece is going to leave at the Eurozone, and that's going to be a nightmare for a Eurozone. I followed it carefully, and I knew in that game of chicken between Greece and the rest of the Troika, Greece had the law, not the upper hand, and therefore they're going to stay in, and therefore the contagion and the collapse of the Eurozone will not occur. Or my signal, that is this boombast.com single, the boombast.com single, tells you when markets are overbought, and we got right, literally, something like eight out of the 10 correction that occurred since 2010 for the S&P 500, because there have been a number of corrections, but we also got right at the bottom. So whenever the market was going down, then when it would recover based on the macro dynamics and the financial dynamics and the macro fundamentals. So the markets have been going up and down, the economy has been slowing down and accelerating. I've been constructive. I've been warning, of course, about the, about the number of downside risk in the global economy. But I guess this time around, people were totally delusional, thinking this will be a correction or a V-shaped recovery. This nonsense was repeated in January and all of February into literally uh, the middle of March. It was only recently when people got in finally a reality check and realizing this is more than the global financial crisis. And we've had a drawdown, not of 10 percent, not of 20 percent, of 35 percent. And even now, people are saying, we reached the bottom, and from here, there's going to be a rally, and we're going to finish the year maybe higher than when we started. That's the view of many Wall Street commentators, that now, because of the stimulus, the economy is going to recover, the market is going to reach higher than the beginning of the year. I don't know what they are smoking, something strange, frankly speaking. You know, Nuria, one of the interesting things that you've written about in terms of your frame for how to determine whether this becomes a greater recession or a greater depression, you have listed three broad categories that, you, that you're that you focusing on in terms of watching government response. Uh, the first is uh, pandemic containment. The second is the monetary response. And the third is the fiscal policy response. Could you talk a little bit about those points and what it is that you're watching specifically to determine what trajectory we're headed on next? Well, the first one and the key element of it is really the uh, health policy response, because unless you're going to stop these pandemics, if it's going to be millions of cases and millions of people going to die, then there is no way you can restart uh, economic activity. And I think that the lesson that came out out of China and also what happened in some of the Asian countries and also the lesson out of Italy that initially did not take it seriously and now is following a Chinese style of quarantine, is that really you have to have the right policy response. It means from very beginning, massive testing, massive essentially tracing of people. You need to have social distancing and social isolations. You need quarantines, you need the lockdowns and the quarantines and lockdowns, unfortunately, cannot be voluntary. Because if they're voluntary, people don't take them seriously. I mean, I'm all in favor of democracy, but China literally, uh, people are getting out of their homes without a good reason, uh, you're kicked back home or you can be arrested or you can be fined. Eventually, even Italy implemented that one. I mean, what has happened in the US with people partying during spring break or taking it not seriously throughout the country is nonsense. The lesson is that either you accept the economic pain that the country is going to be shut down. And of course, GDP can fall 30, 40 percent for a quarter or two. But you need to do it. You shut it down and then you stop the spread of the pandemics. And like in China, now you can restart gradually economic activity. So you have pain, but this front load that is short and then you have a recovery. But if you don't do that response, then the thing is going to spread like wildfire and it's going to be too late when you're doing the mitigations and mitigation policies are not sufficient. You have to go from nothing to serious mitigation to serious suppression, and then you can restart economic activity. If instead you do mitigation or mitigation light and it's spreading like wildfire because it's not enough, then eventually you'll have to do even more severe 
shutdown of economic activity. So it's better to take the pain front loaded for two or three months and then jumpstart growth rather than doing stop and go. You stop, then you go, then you have to stop again, and then you go again and so on. And it's going to end up being a nightmare where everybody's going to get sick and then millions of people are going to be dying. I mean, uh, this past week, uh, Dr. Fauci now, and even the US government says, we'll be lucky now. We'll be lucky if we have millions of cases and we'll be lucky if the number of dead people is only between 100 and 200,000. And Trump uh, on TV on Sunday night said, hey, if we have number of dead being between 100,000 and 200,000, we would have done a very good job. 200,000 people dead, and that's a very good job. And that's optimistic, because at the rate at which this thing is going in the United States, you're having 20% increases of the cases literally per day. We're gonna have 5 million cases at least by the end of April. Could be 10 million, could be 20 million, could be 50 million. And then the numbers of that is gonna be not 100,000 or 200,000 could be half a million to 2 million. That's what we're facing. So the, yes. the health response is key. Unfortunately, we're not doing the right thing on the health side. To put some of those numbers into context, that you know, the even at the low end of the estimate, 100,000 Americans dead is, is twice the level of uh, the casualties uh, we experienced in Vietnam, which is, of course, one of the great sort of national tragedies and traumas of the of the 20th century. Nuriel, where do you think we are in terms of a letter grade based on where, where we are today? We've made some improvements. We've got a while to go. What's your view of that? Well, there are three elements of the policy response. On the health side, I think it's a near fail. It's really mm -hmm. embarrassing because in, in China, the number topped at 80,000. Now, they may be lying, might be not 80,000, but maybe 200,000, 300,000, we don't know. And the number of people might not be uh, the few thousand that they announced, maybe you know, 3,000, maybe 10,000, we don't know. But we know that the number is not in the millions in China and people are going back to work and that's a risk, of course. But in the US now, the government is telling us our baseline is gonna be a few million people and between 100 and 200,000 people dead. That's considered by the president a very good job. It's just unprecedented. The fact we're going to accept that, because now the gene is out of the bottle, they cannot deny anymore that we totally screwed up, that we were first doing nothing, then doing mitigation light, then more mitigation light, then the president wanted to essentially even go back to business as usual after April 1st or after Easter, and only once his advisor told him, you're crazy, you're nuts, now he's saying, well, we're going to continue this mitigation light because it's not even serious mitigation because we're not doing testing and isolation and compulsory quarantines and lockdowns the way other countries are doing. So we're still in mitigation light, let alone trying to do suppression. And we're going to get millions of cases and hundreds of thousands of people dead. That's our baseline right now. And it's scary compared to even other bad examples like Italy. Italy is getting it out of under control right now. They started too late, but now the rate of increase per day has gone down to less than 10%. Eventually, it's going to stop because they've done draconian style, Chinese style of lockdowns. That's what we should have done one month ago or two months ago. We totally blew it up. So on the health response, to me, it's a fail. Accepting that 200 people, 1,000 people are going to die is a fail. It's an F by any standard. It's not even a D. It's a fail. Now, the better news are on the macro policy response, both monetary and fiscal policy, with some caveats. On the monetary side, both the Fed, ECB, and other central banks have massively front-loaded every type of support of the financial system. Again, during the global financial crisis, it took them maybe three years to do the entire kitchen sink of unconventional monetary policy. Now it took them literally less than a month, and most of these decisions were not made at formal meetings of the Fed or ECB, but outside of them in inter-meetings. So we have gone to back to zero policy rates or more negative in some parts of the world. Quantitative easing, forward guidance, credit easing this purchase of private assets, backstopping of banks, of non-banks, of primary dealers, of investment banks, of other financial institutions, backstopping of money market fund, of the money bond market, of commercial paper, 
of uh, uh, investment grade uh, bonds issued by corporations, pretty much flooding the market with unlimited amount of liquidity, unlimited amount of QE. Literally, all the tools that were created over time during the global financial crisis, they took them out of the toolbox and then brought them back in in a matter of a month. Everybody's doing the right thing. And in an emergency like this, providing liquidity, preventing that illiquidity is going to become insolvency is a necessary but not sufficient condition. Now, the third element of the policy response, it's a mixed bag. On this one, the U.S. is ahead of Europe and other parts of the world because in addition to the monetary bazooka, they're also doing the fiscal bazooka. Now, the $2 trillion of the fiscal stimulus is not really $2 trillion of stimulus because a lot of it is just credit guarantees to small enterprises, to the corporate sector. The actual fiscal impulse of how much you spend directly or you transfer to the private sector households is less than that, is less than a trillion. But, you know, the amount of it is liquidity and lending support, you could say it's going to be closer to two trillion. So we have the monetary bazooka, we have the fiscal bazooka. It's not optimized in terms of reaching those who need it the most. I think too much money is going to go to large corporations who don't need it, not as much money to households that are desperate in the United States. Think of it. In U.S., 40% of households have less than $400 of liquid cash to deal with an emergency. People are not going to have money, even with these checks, to buy food. If you're that household and you have lost all of your income and half of the economy is not fully employed people who have unemployment insurance, health care and access to paid six leave. You have all these uh, gig economy, contractor, freelancers, part time workers, hourly workers, entrepreneurs that are business of one, self-employed people. Literally half of the economy is like this. If you live like me in New York, anybody works in hotel, in restaurants, in bars in theater, band, in music, they're not employed. They're just there as gig econ economy workers. They get paid by the project or by the day and so on. The income of these people has gone to zero, zero. These people don't have money to pay rent, and either there is a rent moratorium or they're going to go and stop paying rent on their own. They don't have money to pay their utility bills like electricity, water, gas, internet, phone. And the amount of money they're going to get from the government is going to be barely enough to pay for food and essentials for a month or so, literally a month or so, because people have less than $400 of cash savings. So unless you're going to double down later on on that subsidy to the households, you'll have people who don't have enough food to eat. They're going to go and ride in the streets and you'll get riots and people mobbing the supermarkets. You could have civil violence down the line. That's the situation. So... We're doing the fiscal, but the other countries are not doing it, but we're not doing enough of the right targeted fiscal stimulus. So in, in summary, the health response is an F. The monetary response is an A minus, and the fiscal response is at best, uh, you know, a B minus right now. But even with that, my fear is that we may end up not into a greater recession but in a greater depression for a number of reasons that are not related only to these points, but also to other ones. You know, you've been talking about this structural transformation of the labor market into a gig economy for a long time now. And now we're starting to see what some of those risks may look like. Well, one of the things that you're hearing um, in, you know, in, uh, for example, on uh, economics Twitter is this phrase, um, we're all modern monetary theorists now. Can you talk a little bit about what modern monetary theory is, how it relates to the union of fiscal policy and monetary policy, and whether it's an appropriate policy response to this particular crisis we're in right now? Well, you know, modern monetary theory was uh, a leftist idea uh, supported by a bunch of leftist academics that essentially said, if you're a country that has your own currency and your own central bank, you can run large budget deficits uh, forever. You can monetize them and then you're not going to even have inflation. Now, that extreme view that you can run it forever under good times and bad times, even full employment, and you can monetize fiscal deficit doesn't make sense. But in a situation which you have a collapse of economic activity, you have recession and deflation, and there is a collapse of velocity, we learned that lesson during the global financial crisis, you can do a variant of modern monetary theory. 
budget deficit and the way you monetize them is through QE. It's not officially modern monetary theory, but essentially is a variant of it. And you avoid the deflation and you avoid the deep recession. So it used to be called MMT, modern monetary theory, or used to be called helicopter drop of money, meaning the government spends by issuing bonds and the central bank gives the government the cash and then mm -hmm. you drop it on people, like transfer it, like what they're going to do with the checks right now. Used to be called so people's QE uh, by UK labor. It was labeled as a leftist idea, but guess what has become mainstream? You know, people like uh, Ben Bernanke, former Fed chairman, uh, Stan Fisher, former vice Fed chair, who together with Philip Hildebrand, that used to be run in the Swiss National Bank, is now at BlackRock, the biggest mm -hmm. asset manager in the world, that come up with a proposal for an idea that is a variant of essentially helicopter drop. Uh, Ray Dalio, Adai Turner, Willem Bauter, pretty much mainstream economists. I wrote extensively about the idea of MMT for the next recession already literally a year ago. And I said, when the stuff is going to hit the fan and we're going to have the next recession, zero rate is not going to be enough. Negative is not going to be enough. Forget right. guidance, quantitative easing is not going to be enough. We're going to go to MMT. And guess what? It happened in less than a month, literally, because the way they talk about it right now, Bernanke or Dalio, is not MMT, is not helicopter drop. They call it coordination of monetary and fiscal policy. What does coordination mean? The Treasury is going to issue $2 trillion of bonds, notes, and bills to finance this budget deficit, additional budget deficit, on top of the initial trillion. And the Fed is going to buy every single note, bill, and bond issued by the Treasury. That's what's called coordination, right? But what is it? What's the difference between coordination and helicopter drop or between coordination and QE with a fiscal deficit? It's close to zero. In mm -hmm. the case of deficit and QE, you are buying the bonds in the secondary market. The government sells it to the market and then the Fed buys it for the market. When you do MMT or monetary financing or helicopter drop, you're buying it directly in the primary market. But the impact on long-term interest rate is the same. Who cares whether the Fed buys it at issuance or a month later? Substantial doesn't make any difference. Even large deficit in QE is effectively MMT. Whether you call it that way or you call it something else or euphemistically um, coordination of monetary and fiscal policy, it walks and quacks like a duck is helicopter drop. That's what it is. And we're going to see massive helicopter drop. Now, the point that I made, however, is the following one. In the short run, doing helicopter drop makes sense. Makes sense because we have had a collapse not only of supply and disruption of supply chains, but we also have had a collapse of demand. So we have had recession and right now deflationary pressures. And therefore, doing a massive fiscal stimulus and monetizing it makes sense when you have stuck deflation recession and deflation. That makes sense in the short run. But as people say, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool all of the people all of the time. Suppose that you are in a world in which these budget deficits of 10% of GDP fully monetized occur not only this year, but actually in a downside scenario, we might have them next year and the following year. Right. In the short run, we have a demand shock more than a supply shock, and that's the way you fight it. But think about this shock. Over time, this is a negative supply shock that reduces output and potential output and increases costs and essentially the production cost and the prices of every type of goods and service. The disruption of global supply chain, soon enough, we're not gonna have enough farm workers in California to pick up the fruits and the vegetables. Over time, what this shock is going to lead, is going to lead to an exacerbation of the decoupling between US and China. Even before that, I wrote last year and before, we had a cold war, we have two cities trapped, we're going to have deglobalization, we'll have decoupling and fragmentation. All these trends are going to be emphasized. More you decoupling, know, you know, more reglobalization, more reshoring, more fragmentation, more balkanization of the global economy, more tariff, more protectionism, more defending your own firms and your own workers, more inward policies, 
more restriction to trade in goods, in services, in labor, in capital, in technology. This is a massive negative supply shock to the global economy. You monetize it and you fiscalize it for two or three years. Eventually, you end up into not stuck deflation, but in stagflation, recession, and inflation, like the 1970s. Look what happened in the 70s. We had two old shocks, 73 Yom Kippur, 79 Iranian Revolution. We reacted by trying to boost economic growth. We had deficits and monetization. Through easy money, we ended up with double-digit inflation and stagflation. By next year, we can be in stagflation, the worst of all worlds, high inflation and recession. That's yeah. what gets us to a depression, not just a recession. You know, Nuriel, you know, one of the things that I found so interesting is somebody who's followed your work very closely, uh, you wrote in a Project Syndicate piece, and I think it's probably worth quoting here. Moreover, the fiscal response could hit a wall if the monetization of massive deficits starts to produce high inflation, especially if a series of virus-related negative supply-side shocks reduces potential growth. One of the things that's been very interesting for people who have followed your work, during the Great Recession, you talked about how there was a collapse and the response to the Great Recession, how there was a collapse in the velocity of money and that we didn't see these inflationary pressures building. This is a significant shift from that position. Perhaps you could talk a little bit more about what it would look like and how we would start to notice that risk case coming online. Well, the global financial crisis, I analyzed it, was a credit shock that led to a collapse in aggregate demand. You had a big output gap, slack in goods and labor market. You had wages going down, prices going down, deflation. And therefore, if you did uh, effectively MMT, that's what we did through the back door through QE and deficits, you're essentially avoiding that recession from becoming a depression with deflation. That was the right policy response because there was a collapse of aggregate demand and there was a huge output gap. Today is different. The type of shocks that are going to hit the global economy are all negative supply shock. As I pointed out, the coronavirus, the breakdown of global supply chain is going to get worse. I fear that we're not going to be able to produce food. That In many parts of the world, as the crisis become worse, food workers and the food supply chain is going to be disrupted. If you cannot produce food, then you'll have a shock to food prices. I mean, look at what happened in China. You had a small shock that was last year, the swine flu, and the swine flu alone led to production of pigs to collapse by 50%, that to kill all of them, and price of pork went up 100%. This was just a little tiny swine flu in China. Think about how these pandemics can disrupt a global supply chains in around the world, and especially food supply chains. That's a huge negative supply shock. And after the crisis, the coupling between US and China is gonna get worse. The US is blaming China for this. China is blaming the United States. If we had the Cold War before, if we had the Thucydides trap on technology, on trade, on services, on finance, on currency, it's gonna get worse. Look at the rhetoric between the two sides. So we'll have more balkanization, more decoupling, more deglobalization, more reshoring that's costly. Because instead of producing in the lowest cost parts of the world, we're going to produce them expensively at home. That's a massive negative supply shock. Trade wars. In the 30s, the smooth holy tariff led to the worsening of the financial shock and led us to the Great Depression. Now we're starting trade wars with China and the rest of the world. They're going to get worse. Everybody's going to say, I'm going to protect my workers, my firms, my tariffs, and so on. That's a recipe for a negative supply shock that comes global. We're not even sharing medical supplies. Every country wants to have their own ventilators, their own masks at home. We're not even letting export of these things across country. This is the right. beginning of restricting trade in goods, in services, in capital, in labor. Trump is going to say, I was right bashing China. I was right to build the wall. Guess what? You can build any wall you want to with Mexico or Canada, but the disease is going to be beyond the wall. It transmits regardless of whether you have a wall or not. This is the nature of global pandemics. So these supply shocks become global. And I'm not yet at the point where there'll be other supply shocks. I really worry there'll be a war between U.S. and Iran this year in the Middle East. And we'll have another supply shock on all prices, like we saw in 73, 79, or 1990. That's still to come. That will be another huge supply shock. So we're going to be going in a world where most of the shocks are not aggregate demand, but their nature is negative supply shock through 
essentially deglobalization, pandemic, all shocks, protectionism, nationalism, and inward policies. In that world, you have essentially the condition for stagflation, recession and inflation like the 70s, because as I said, if it's the demand shock like the global financial crisis, you monetize, you fiscalize it, you return to growth. But if it's a negative supply shock, you monetize it, you fiscalize it, and eventually you end up in stagflation. Now, we're not bad enough to end up like Zimbabwe or Venezuela or Argentina with hyperinflation. Even if advanced economies after World War I, like the Weimar Republic in Germany, had hyperinflation or Hungary. Those things can happen if you have a total collapse. If we get a depression, and in this depression, we're going to run budget deficit, print them, we may end up like Hungary or Germany during the Weimar Republic after World War I. We could get hyperinflation. I don't expect that to happen now, but certainly we could get stagflation with rising inflation and recession like the 70s. If we keep on, keep on kicking the count down the road and stimulate the economy, if the persistent sets of negative supply shock keep on coming and coming. That's not a risk this year, but by next year, two years from now, that will be a meaningful rising risk. And Nuriel, that's a, a grim and sobering outlook. Let me shift gears a little bit here. I think we have a pretty good frame for what your view is and what your outlook is. Can you talk to us about some of the data that you're seeing? What's led you to these conclusions? And importantly, what could lead you to reverse your conclusions in that it could potentially be a shorter, shallower, less severe recession that you anticipate? So what are you looking at that brought you to these conclusions and what could lead you to reverse them? Now, before I go to that one, let me finalize a point. The argument about the greater recession becoming greater depression is based essentially on three key columns. Column number one is the health response is wrong. Mm. We're doing mitigation, we're not doing suppression. And even if we're doing suppression, the virus is going to mutate. And by next winter, when we're supposed to go back to growth after a recession of three quarters, we could have another spike in the pandemic, even under suppression. If we're not going to have suppression, but only mitigation, it's going to be a nightmare, as any epidemiological model suggests. So what's when the we're supposed to recover, we're going to go back to another recession. Yes? I'm sorry, what's the difference between those two points, mitigation versus suppression? Well, mitigation is this kind of voluntary social distancing, isolation, stay at home. Uh, we're going to shut down maybe businesses in New York and California, but the rest of the country can op stay open, stores, businesses, economic activity, restaurants, and we're doing mitigation and it's actual mitigation light. Suppression means, sorry guys, we shut down every economic activity apart from basic essentials. You stay at home compulsory, you cannot work unless you work from home, you cannot go out unless you go and buy food and medicines and take a walk for half an hour just to refresh a day and no more. And we're going to monitor you and we're going to punish you. If you do otherwise, fines, arrest, whatever. And like in China, they use drones and robots. And literally an app that gives to everybody a green, yellow, or red card. It's Big Brother in China. We don't want to go there. But the reality is that you have to find an enforcement. If you don't enforce it and you're basing yourself on people doing voluntarily, it's going to be mitigation, mitigation light. We're not doing even mitigation. We're doing mitigation light in the U.S., let alone suppression. Mm -hmm. Suppression was what China did for three months and what Italy is doing right now. We're not doing it. So in that situation, it's going to go like wildfire this year. And then once we control it and summer comes, the winter is going to come. The virus is going to mutate. We're not going to have a vaccine for 18 months. These antiviral or other therapeutics are in limited supply. We don't even know whether they work. Guaranteed. By next winter, we'll have another spike in the pandemic. That's why people say it will be a three-quarter recession. Q1, Q2, Q3, but then by the fall, we're going to start growing again. What if by the fall, we have another round of this pandemic, then we're going to go into depression. Two, by next year, if we're going in another recession, is continuing, then we'll have to do another 10% of GDP fiscal stimulus and monetize. And then we end up into the kind of inflationary situation that I warned about that leads you to stagflation. And then you have a nightmare of stagflation. And three, as I pointed out in a number of pieces recently, there's a wide range of geopolitical risk, a, literally a global rivalry between US, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. And this country is gonna to try to disrupt the US economy, the US political system. We'll have the first global cyber war uh, in, the, in this country this year, and it's gonna create geopolitical chaos, politically 
even violence after the U.S. election, let alone the risk of a war between U.S. and Iran in the Middle East. So there's this trifecta or Bermuda Triangle of the wrong health response and the fact that the virus is going to come back next winter, of running out of policy bullets once we monetize fiscal deficit forever, and then geopolitical shock, there are negative supply and that lead us to a geopolitical depression. That's a recipe for a greater depression. How, how do you quantify some of those risks, Nero, when you look at, when you talk about things like, for example, cyber warfare or the potential for a hot war in the Gulf, how do you quantify what those risks look like? Well, right now, markets are completely disregarded. In the case of the war between US and Iran, they're saying, we kill Soleimani, they send a bunch of rockets, we restrain ourselves, now Iran is contained and they're not going to do anything. I think that is the wrong analysis of what's happening in Iran. You know, I happen to be a Persian Jew, understand how the Iranian think. And mm. I tell you, uh, simply, and I could discuss it for hours, mm. if, they, uh, if Trump is reelected, the regime in Iran is dead because four more years of sanction and other pressure means they collapse. And the regime wants to stay in power. The only one goal they have is to stay in power. That's a paramount. And it's not going to be an external shock that leads to regime change, but an internal revolution. So suppose that Iran escalates the situation in the Middle East to proxies, initially attacking Israel, Saudi Arabia, creating chaos with its own proxies, and then sucking U.S. in a conflict. What's going to happen? All now is that below 20, it's going to spike to 150. The stock market is going to crash, and the recession is going to become more severe, like 73, like 79, like 1990. And once that happens, there's not going to be regime change in Iran. Why? Even if we bomb the hell out of Iran in that war with an aerial campaign, the regime stays in power. You need to have one million boots on the ground in order to have regime change in Iran. And we're not going to have one million people, American soldiers going and invading Iran. It's going to be air campaign. And once you bomb Iran, even half of the country that is against the regime is going to support the regime because they're nationalists. If you attack them, even those who hate uh, Khamenei are going to support him the same way they went and rallied by the millions when we killed Soleimani. So we're not going to have regime change in Iran. The regime, the Iran can cause a spike in oil prices, a collapse of the stock market bigger than this one, and a more severe recession. And once that happens, regime change is going to occur, not in Iran, but it's going to occur in the United States. Look at the three previous geopolitical shocks in the Middle East, 73, 79, and 1990. After these shocks, we had recession, stock market crash, and inflation. Guess what? Carter beat Ford in 76. Uh, uh, Reagan beat uh, Carter, and uh, Clinton beat Bush. So three times you had a geopolitical shock in the Middle East with an oil price spike, and you had regime change, not in Iran, in two of those three cases, you had regime change in the United States. That's what happened. So if we have that shock, Trump is dead, literally, politically. So the Iranians know it, and even if they are weaker right now, in my view, not now, but by the early summer, they're going to escalate the tension in the Middle East. And mark my word, there'll be a war between U.S. and Iran. It's also a very sobering assessment. Um, you know, you, you've covered your view of, of the potential impact of the oil markets. Uh, another question that I had for you is, uh, when you look at when you look at the potential for credit shock, when you think about bond yields, what's your outlook um, on that front? Well, as I pointed out, uh, even before, for the last two years, we had a debt bubble in the United States, and that debt bubble was mostly in the corporate sector. The last debt crisis was households, mortgages, and leveraged banks. This time around, we've been saying is the corporate sector and shadow banks that finance them, CLOs, leverage loans, uh, fallen angels in high grade, uh, trillions of dollars of uh, high yield junk bond issued with uh, weak uh, covenants, covenant light, with uh, loosening of uh, lending and credit standards. It was just toxic, it was, was a crisis waiting to happen. And guess what? When a similar shock occurred in 2016, spread went from 300 to 900 for high yield, but it took about three months, and then they went down back to normal once we realized we're not going to have a global recession. This time around, they've spiked in less than a month from 300 to 1,100, and the entire market for high yield, leverage loans, 
CLOs has completely shut down. Even firms that were high grade issuing commercial paper and corporate bonds could not issue them. That's why the Fed and the Treasury have come to the rescue of the high grade. But there are two problems. Even if you have a plan to essentially backstop commercial paper and high grade uh, debt, uh, you're not going to take care of all the firms that are issuing junk bonds because, of course, the Fed cannot take that credit risk. So you can backstop high grade, but not high yield. And you cannot backstop the millions or dozens of millions of small firms that don't issue bonds, like small and medium sized enterprises have no access to the capital market. It's only larger firms, high yield and high grade. Two, you're taking a huge credit risk even for the high grade, because within the high grade, you have a trillion dollar of uh, bonds that are triple B minus. They are on the verge of being downgraded to junk. Right. And Ford was just downgraded to junk. A big firm like Ford has been downgraded from triple B to junk. And the Fed now is telling us we're going to take and we're going to buy high grade bonds, including triple B minus. To me, it's a mistake. Because most of these guys, even if you backstop them, the fundamental is going to lead to a downgrade. And once they're downgraded, you are taking a market risk because then there is a spike in the spread and you do a mark to market loss on your portfolio as a Fed. And you're taking a huge credit risk. I would have said if you want to backstop corporate bonds, do it for high grade and exclude fallen angels. Instead, they decided to save the fallen angels. But even by doing that, you still have all the high yield that is essentially not backstop. You have leverage loans and you have CLOs and you have every firm that is not even issuing debt. That is the majority of firms in the country who are not issuing bonds. They have to use either banks or other forms of lending. So we have already a debt crisis. Let's speak about it. With oil at 20, most of shale gas and oil producer in a matter of months are going to be bankrupt, completely bankrupt. And it's not only them, anybody in hotel, cruise lines, hospitality, bars, restaurants, and big chains, retail, they were highly leveraged before. That segment of the market also is effectively bankrupt. These are not illiquid but solvent firms. We should not bail them out. These are illiquid and that current economic conditions, they are insolvent. And if we're going to bail them out, there'll be a massive loss for the treasury and for the U.S. taxpayer. The whole point is you want to save those who are illiquid but solvent, but in the high yield, in the junk area, there is tons of stuff that is illiquid and it's insolvent. And you should not backstop them. Otherwise, you're literally privatizing the gains again, socializing the losses again for equity holders and for other bondholders and creditors. That would be unfair. But we're not going to do it, hopefully. You know, one of the things that comes up in this context is the risk of moral hazard uh, for backstopping debt and for companies that have... Uh, effectively been engaging in massive share buyback programs. That's generated us an incredible amount of, of angst and, uh, and blowback against corporate America. Absolutely. For the last you know, decade, the amount of share buybacks has been huge, has been artificially increasing earnings per share and the growth of earnings per share, boosted valuation, and since compensation of many CEOs and senior managers are based on valuation, they literally pocketed those gains for themselves and they've done something reckless because if you do share buyback, you're changing your capital structure. You're reducing the amount of equity in your firm and you're increasing the amount of debt because most of the share buybacks were financed for those who are not profitable by essentially issuing debt. So you have essentially leveraged up your capital structure with more debt, less equity. You made yourself vulnerable and now the shock occurs and you may go bankrupt. And there's a huge moral hazard because even if the law says you cannot use this money for a share buyback, that's the minimum, of course, that you need to do. But the share buybacks were done in the past. You made yourself financially fragile. You made yourself near insolvent. And now you're asking for a government bailout because you screwed up and you privatized the gains and you socialized the losses for a decade. And now I'm supposed to backstop the equity holders and the existing creditors by giving a bailout. It is still bailing out people and socializing the losses, even if you say that you cannot increase compensation of CEOs and you cannot do more share buybacks. 
the damage and the moral hazard occurred for the last decade. Let's shift gears here a little bit. Um, I think most people think of you and your background in, in, in the academic world, but you've also spent a, a long time in government and in supranational organizations. I think I can get these right. You're at the IMF, the World Bank, the Fed, Bank of Israel, at the White House, the Council of Economic Advisors during the Clinton administration, at Treasury as a senior advisor to Tim Geithner. Help us understand especially on the monetary policy side. I think that a lot of people have been going up to the, you know, for example, the Fed website, they see this alphabet soup of liquidity facilities in addition to, um, you know, the, the low interest rate policy that we're at, the ZERB policy. Help us understand how some of these liquidity facilities actually function and how they transmit into the real economy some of that liquidity. Well, these liquidity facilities have the following feature. There are many parts of the financial system that are stressed, mm -hmm. that uh, suddenly everybody wants cash, uh, even uh, government bonds, let alone uh, uh, things like uh, uh, corporate bonds or equities becomes too risky. So when there is this scramble and everybody is going from equity to government bonds and from government bonds into cash, then there is a demand for liquidity. And if you don't fund that liquidity, you have these stresses in what's called funding markets with very exotic markets like repo having interest rates not close to zero, but close to five, 10 percent, like it happened even last year. Some of it is highly technical, but essentially uh, think of it this way to think how the market got distressed in March. Usually when there is risk off, stock market goes down, but then bond yields go lower because people move money from equity into safe U.S. Treasury. So bond yields go lower. And while you're losing money in your equity portfolio, you make money in your bond portfolio. So suppose you're a typical investor that they recommend you 60-40, 60 equity and 40 bonds. Whenever there is a negative shock, you lose money on equity and you make money on your bonds because the yield goes down, the price goes up, and that's a mark-to-market gain. So that's the way you are insuring yourself. So most of modern portfolio theory, most of institutional investors, even, even the hedge funds, what is risk parity The Ray Dalio and Bridgewater was doing is a variant of 60-40. But instead of being 60-40, you're enhancing your bond side of the portfolio by leveraging it. Because you know that when there is a shock to equity, you want to be even more than 40 into bonds. But between this year, between March 9 and March 21st, for almost two, three weeks, something crazy occurred. And the crazy thing occurred was the stock market was in free fall, going down 10%, 20, and then 30. Right. And bond yields that initially went down, because initially in February, they went from about 1% uh, down to uh, 0.3. So initially the market reaction was the normal one. Uh, stock market is down, bond yields are down, you lose money on the equities, you make money on bond. But after March 9 and until March 23rd, something crazy happened. And the crazy thing happened was that bond yields in the treasury market, instead of going lower towards zero, they went from 30 basis points in a matter of two weeks to 125. You had an increase of almost 100 basis points in bond yields. That meant you made losses of 10% on your holding of bonds. So all these portfolios, 60, 40, even Ray Dalio's risk parity, why they lost so much money in March? because they were losing money on equities, they were losing money on bonds. This was not supposed to happen because risky assets go down in price, but safe assets go up in price. So during that three week period, government bonds were going down in price, not just credit, government bonds, safe treasuries were going down in price. Gold was going down in price. The Swiss franc was losing uh, the yen. So every risky asset, whether it was treasury bonds, or boons, or JGBs, or Swiss franc, or yen, or gold, was going down in price. So there was nowhere to hide. The only place where you could hide was literally cash, was the only thing that gives you zero return, but doesn't fall in price. We have not seen this thing uh, ever before. There were periods of stress during the global financial crisis, where we had three weeks in which every asset, risky asset and safe asset, were collapsing in price. So you're losing money. That's why the genius of Ray Dalio lost a fortune on his risk parity portfolio. It was supposed to be the portfolio that does well in good times and bad times. Even the smartest people in the world lost money. All the quant funds lost money. Why? Because the normal correlation between equity and bonds broke down. 
instead of one going up and the other going down, both of them were going out, down, and you were losing money. That was the liquidity shock. Right. And what happened was that when the Fed decided then, unlimited QE, support money market, support commercial paper, support high grade, support and give liquidity to the banks, to non-banks, primary dealers, everybody in the financial system. The investment banks did not have access to the liquidity of the Fed. That's why they, they were leveraged they had to sell everything. And as they were selling everything, even treasury were collapsing. Once the Fed realized we have a problem of liquidity and we need to provide liquidity and they did everything, then things normalized. Stock prices were going down still after March uh, 19. They were going down at least for another week, but bond yields they went to 125, went back to 75 basis points. So the normal correlation became normal because the shock to the market was one of illiquidity. And once you right. flood the market with liquidity, at least you had safety. You had safety in gold, you had safety in treasury, and you had safety in other things. So there was a massive liquidity shock that was destroying every historical correlation. There was nowhere to hide but cash. And there was not enough, of course, cash out there until the Fed started to print. They printed stuff of the order of 70 billion every day. Think about the printing machine. Every day buying 70 billion of treasuries. And in a matter of 10 days, you have almost a trillion dollar. That's what the Fed did. Became a huge, the biggest printing machine in the world. And there was a liquidity problem of a lack of dollar, not only in the US, but also in the rest of the world, in Asia, in Europe. So what did they do? They restarted the swap lines. That means that if you are the ECB or Bank of Japan, you can borrow dollars from the Fed, hundreds of billions, lend it to your banks, and your banks can lend it to your corporates. That's why the dollar was skyrocketing in that period. It was a scramble for liquidity. There was a dollar in liquidity, and the dollar was going through the roof. So you had this weird phenomenon of dollar in spite of the Fed easing money going up rather than down in value. It was, again, the same illiquidity. The shortage of dollar liquidity was becoming global. This was just something we've never seen before. So do you think there's still systemic risk there? So, I mean, there was a lot of worry initially about the about the breakdown of those correlations, about the unwind of the risk parity trade. Has that trillion dollars in liquidity backstopped it sufficiently, or is there still potential systemic risk in the future if that correlation breaks down again? Well, the, the systemic risk doesn't come only from that correlation breaking down and what the Fed right now has done for the time being is stabilizing that correlation. The systemic risk comes from the amount of debt and leverage in the system. It's not just the debt and leverage that uh, finance stock market position, but most importantly, the structural of debt markets. We have essentially corporate debt between CLO, leveraged loans, high yield and grade, that is at historic highs. And a debt crisis was going to happen regardless of. In the household sector, is uh, who's going to pay your student loans, your auto loans, your mortgages? Uh, your credit cards, if this is going to become a Great Depression, currently the banks look like safe. Why? Mm -hmm. Unlike the non-banks and the shadow banks, they have liquidity, they have capital. But right. that capital buffer is for a, a regular recession. It's not the capital buffer for a greater recession or for a greater depression. So people say shadow banks that finance the corporate sector are going to go bust. But many of these shadow banks, by the way, P firms and capital markets and prime brokers and hedge funds, where do they fund themselves? They fund themselves from banks, right? At the end of the day, the money comes from the banks. So if they go bust, eventually banks are going to lose money. Two, you have the massive exposure of the banking system to both commercial and residential real estate and to consumer credit and also to small businesses. You know, the, the, the current guarantee says that if you do a credit, uh, a loan guaranteed by the SBA, you're going to be essentially guaranteed 100%, up to 10 million for each one of these loans, for a maximum of about 350 billion. Now, 350 billion is spare change, right? So if many small businesses are going to go bust, and we're speaking about trillions of dollars of bank loans, then those MPLs are going to sharply rise if you have a greater depression and the banks could be in trouble. So the systemic risk come from the credit markets and the debt funds and the credit funds that can go bust and cause a fire sales. It can go through a seizure and the, the defaults and the crisis in the corporate debt market and only the high grade 
is being backstopped by the Fed, and it could then spread into the banking system. That's the fundamental source of that systemic risk. Mm. It's not just a risparity. The risparity, investors in Redalio's fund can lose money. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, that, that's the key thing. There are bigger things happening. Right. And one of those bigger things that you mentioned, you talked about uh, the massive dollar liquidity shortage um, and that's being supported now with uh, cross-border central bank swap lines. How does that liquidity shortage develop? What's the underlying risk there? Well, around the world, lots of people, governments, corporations, even households, in some countries, your mortgages are uh, priced in dollars to right. ask for you know, various types of risk. So there is a huge amount of dollar debt of the public sector, government they issue dollar debt in Euro bond markets, and private sector, corporations, banks, and even some households. So what happens is that now, given the shock that occurred, risk off, the dollar was strengthening, and the value of currencies around the world was falling. Now, in local currency, if you borrow it in dollar, and your currency depreciates, the real value in peso, in real, in uh, krona, whatever not, of your dollar debt goes higher because you have a devaluation of your currency. That's called the balance sheet effect of having foreign currency debt when your currency depreciates. And therefore, you have a risk of illiquidity and insolvency. So as the currency of all these countries were going down in value, the real value of your dollar debt was going higher. Everybody was essentially long dollar debt borrowed in dollar, everybody was trying to buy dollar to hedge essentially their dollar liabilities. And as people were trying to sell pesos and liras and buy dollar, their currency were depreciating and the mm. value of the dollar was skyrocketing. And you had this massive dollar illiquidity, not just in US, but in Europe, in Asia, in advanced economies and emerging markets. Now, there are two solutions to that. One, the swap lines within the Fed and major central banks in the world. That helps uh, Europe and Japan, doesn't help uh, emerging markets because most of the swap lines initially were only with ECB, BOJ, SMB, and advanced economies. that are complicated the rules of lending money to emerging markets directly from the Fed. And certainly US doesn't want to lend money to China. Mm. Uh, so in addition to the Fed providing global liquidity and being an international lender of last resort for advanced economies, somebody has to provide liquidity to backstop emerging markets where you have a huge amount of dollar debt. Which are the international end of last resort? Is the IMF and the World Bank, right? If you are the central bank of Mexico, you can print pesos. But if you have dollar debt, you cannot backstop your firms or your government by issuing dollars by definition, right? right? So the IMF and the World Bank can help emerging markets, their governments, and then indirectly their firms and their banks, but the current amount of capital of the IMF and the World Bank allows them to lend only $1 trillion globally. Now, $1 trillion looks like a lot of money. In normal time, it is, because mm. you have one little Argentina or one little Turkey needs your money. So you are having lots of funding and lending capacity. But when you have now 50, 60 countries going to beg the IMF and the World Bank lend right. me money, you're going to run out a trillion dollars very fast. That's why in emerging market, the need to hedge your dollar risk is in the order of three to four trillion dollars. So the, the Fed cannot help you. The IMF can help you only to the tune of a trillion dollar. Right. Therefore, the downside risk for many emerging markets are still severe. You need and a bigger lend of last resort at the global level. You need to fund the IMF. You have to increase the capital so they can lend more. And this is all happening against a backdrop of a collapse in global cross-border trade, much of which is denominated in dollars. Yes. It is denominated in dollars. So when the dollar falls, the cost of imports for these countries go higher. Many of these economies in emerging markets also are, one, commodity exporters, and mm -hmm. the price of all commodities is collapsing because there is a recession, not just oil, uh, copper, industrial metal, and so on. And these economies are also export-led growth. So if you have a mm -hmm. collapse of your export because there's a recession in US, Europe, and the rest of the world, you have another terms of trade shock on commodities and on exports of goods and services. So you have a recession that is transmitted through commodity, financial, and trade channels. You have a huge amount of dollar debts of these emerging markets of the government and or of the private sector, and you don't have an international lender of last resort who is willing and able to print enough dollars or lend you enough dollar to deal with this shock. 
That's why whenever there is a risk off, in advanced economies, things go south. And we had a 30% fall in US and other advanced economies equities. But the shock in the emerging market is bigger. The shock not just to their stock market, but to their debt markets. EM spreads for sovereigns go sharply up. EM spreads for corporates, not just in a foreign currency, but even local currency, they go higher. So the stresses for emerging markets are much more severe. If you're in advanced economies, you can print your money, you can run a budget deficit, your market is going to strengthen. If you're an emerging market, you print money and you run a budget deficit, you're going to have inflation and collapse of your currency. And then you'll have balance sheet problems and you have inflation. That's because, you know, these emerging markets don't have the same policy credibilities as advanced economies. So in our Europe, US and Japan, we can run 10% budget deficit and print money and everything is going to slightly improve over time. In emerging market, you run a 10% budget deficit, you monetize it, you risk ending up like Zimbabwe or Venezuela or Argentina. You don't have those options. So your policy options are also restricted in emerging markets. Yeah, and, and, and the final question before we wrap up here, what's a, a place where we've seen a lot of activity has been in, in, in the FX markets. What's your outlook for the dollar uh, and what are you looking for in that context? Well, you know, usually whenever there is a risk of episode, people tend to uh, dump other risky assets and currencies and go to the safety of a few assets. They tend to be U.S. treasuries and, and the dollar because the dollar is considered as a safe haven currency. Um, however, during this uh, financial crisis and risk of episode, the dollar becomes uh, the safe haven for, say, uh, Europe and for Latin America, but the Swiss franc becomes the safe haven currency for the Eurozone or mm. the Japanese yen becomes the safe haven currency for Asia. During that episode between March 9 and March 20, when everything was really, the correlation were going berserk, the dollar was going through the roof, but other safe haven currencies like Swiss franc and yen were falling sharply in value because you had this uh, lack of dollar liquidity. Now that the dollar liquidity problem is being normalized by the Fed, at least the Fed does it, the IMF can do it partly for emerging markets, EM currency is gonna weaken further out the US dollar because there is no funding, but maybe the uh, relation between US dollar and euro and yen is going to relatively stabilize. We are printing money like crazy, but they're printing money like crazy also in Europe and Japan. Mm -hmm. So among major currencies, uh, probably they could have a currency stability. Now, over time, of course, whether the dollar goes up relative to euro and yen depends on what happens to the economy and the markets in Europe and US relative to each other. And mm -hmm. that's harder to say. But if we have another episode of severe risk off, even with the flooding by the Fed of liquidity, then if markets are going to go south and people seek the safety of U.S. treasuries, then they have to sell yen and euro to buy U.S. treasuries, and that strengthens the U.S. dollar. So the U.S. dollar for now is still the only true safe haven, and therefore other episodes. In my view, the current market has not bottomed out. People say when we fell 35% was the beginning of a rally. And guess what? Last week, market went up 15%. They're still 25% below the peak. They say this is the bottom. It's not the case. In many of these bear markets and in many of these recessions, you have a fake head rally in a bear market. Yeah. You have a debt cut bounce. So I interpret what happened last week as a debt cut bounce or a fake head rally. Why do I say that? The entire set of policy news now is priced in. People know huge monetary bazooka, huge fiscal bazooka. That's already known and it's priced in. The two things are not priced in is the spread of the epidemic and how bad the economic news are gonna be. So all the good policy news are already out and mm. are in the market, they're fully priced. While every day we're hearing the contagion is spreading, US and globally worse than expected. And the economic news surprise on the downside. As I said, instead of 2 million unemployment claims, 3.3 million. So if you think about the flows of news in the next two months, the bad news on the economy and the macro and on the health situation and the contagion are going to be worse than expected. While the good economic news that central banks and governments are using their bazooka is already known. 
Now, there is a case in which we'll have more fiscal stimulus as a surprise. What will be that case if the economy becomes so bad and if the pandemic becomes so worse that we need a fourth fiscal package to give money to households that are starving? But if that fiscal policy surprise were to occur, it will occur only because the health news are becoming so bad and the macro news are becoming so bad that we need another fiscal stimulus. So even that surprise that we'll have a fourth package is not going to be good news for the market because the trigger for that surprise on the policy is going to be terrible negative surprises on the macro and on the health situation. So it's going to be a wash or on net, actually, the bad news are going to dominate the positive one. So I fear mm -hmm. that until we have positive news on the macro and we have positive news on the health situation, the market can go only south. Of course, they're not going to go south in a linear way. Someday they can go up, someday they can go down. But this is not the bottom of the market. This is not the beginning of the rally. We we'll, we'll need to reach a point in which we've done enough testing and we've done enough suppression that we know that we're going to stop this virus. Maybe two months from now, maybe three months from now. The market need to be able to price risk. They can price risk when you have a distribution is known. They cannot price uncertainty when you have a distribution with fat tails. And right now we have huge fat tails on what the health situation is going to be. Are going to be 100,000, 200,000, 1 million, 2 million people dying of these things. We have no idea. And unless we do testing, tracing, suppression, we don't know what's the end point where the second derivative becomes negative and eventually asymptotically the number of new cases goes to zero. Once we know that, the market can price in things from there on. And once we know that the economy is really bottomed out and we're going to see light at the end of the tunnel, the market can go up. So this is a dead cut bounce. This is a head fake rally. This is not the bottom because of the reasons I discussed. You know, it's and, and if the geopolitics, if the health pandemics and the policy response runs out of battle and instead of a greater recession, we end up into a greater depression, that's not priced in. The market right now are fully pricing in a greater recession. They believe that by second or third quarter, we bottom out, and then by the third or fourth quarter, we started to grow positively. If this recession is going to continue in Q4 into 2021 because we have a greater depression, there's a 30% probability, in my view, it's not the baseline, the baseline is 60% greater recession, that if the probability of a greater depression occurs, in a greater depression, market go down not by 35%, they go down by 50 to 60, and then they don't rally back. They stay down there for a while. That's a tail risk that's not priced by the market, and it's a rising tail risk. You know, it's all the same meta themes. It's uh, unpriceable tail risk, asymmetric downside risks, unknowns and unknowables, breakdowns of historical correlations, and really an uncertain outlook. Muriel, thank you so much for joining us. In conclusion, we've gotten a lot of information. What should people be looking for very specifically, key data points going forward that might influence the chain of events that may unfold? First of all, as I said, you have to be defensive. This is not the bottom. It could be a fake head rally. So it's not the time to plunge into risky assets. You have to look as, especially at the contagion, at the health situation. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Is the second derivative of the contagion becoming negative? Is there asymptotically a time, May, June, or July, when the number of new cases are going to go to zero? That's going to be key. What's the healthcare response? Are we going from mitigation light into true mitigation? Are we going from mitigation into suppression? If we're not going to go into full suppression, and we're going to do this mitigation, things are going to get worse. That's a key. Secondly, the macroeconomic data, in my view, for now are going to surprise on the downside. Growth, unemployment, defaults, and you name it. Until we start to see things are priced in fully and the economic news on the macro becomes surprised on the upside rather than the downside, we're not going to see a true bottom. So you have to look at the macroeconomic news and you have to look at the health news. Those are the two key things to understand when we're going to bottom out whether this is going to be a greater recession or a greater depression, and when there is light at the end of the tunnel. It's not yet at the moment, but you have to monitor all of these factors, the health ones and the macro ones, and of course the policy. But for now, the policy is priced in. Uriel, thank you for joining us. Good being with you today. Thank you. If you're ready to go beyond the interview, make sure you visit realvision.com, where you can try Real Vision Plus for 30 days for just $1. We'll see you next time right here 
Unreal Vision.